never take for granted our time of worship together in the present moment here and now on this side of eternity to be able to glorify and praise our King. My name is Seth. Welcome to Believer's Chapel. It is so great to have you with us. I will be sharing with you this morning um, on a message on what it is to give thanks. Ultimately, the secret of gratitude. As a people, we recognize the importance of gratitude. Gratitude is a virtue really that's within us as we appreciate the things around us, as we take time to recognize the blessings in our life, all that we have to be thankful for. And when we come to a place of thanksgiving, our hearts are full, we are satisfied, we are content. And so really, it's from the very virtue of gratitude that most other virtues flow. Even the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all flow from a heart that is full of thanksgiving, a heart that is content before God. If you would, you can turn to two different places this morning. First of all, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 33 is where we'll be. And then if you would put a marker in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 13, we're going to be flipping right over to that for Matthew. But if you would join me in prayers, we ask that God would speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, God, truly it's amazing to be in your presence. Lord, that you would dwell amongst the praises of your people. God, that you would join us here. God, we should be amazed by you and your love for us. God, it should be, Lord, swelling our hearts with praise, with thanksgiving, filling us up with gratitude. Father, I pray that would be the case this morning. Lord, that even now as we open your word, God, as we submit ourselves to you, Lord, that you would speak to us. God, through your word, which is alive and powerful. God, you would give us revelation, a different perspective. God, a greater understanding of you and who it is we praise. God, truly, you are amazing, and we bless your name in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Even as a people, as a nation, we are about a week and a half away from Thanksgiving. It's coming quick. The year has flown by. Uh, but as, as a nation, we recognize the importance of gratitude. And we have this day set aside called Thanksgiving, which originated about 394 years before where there was uh, William Bradford and his crew of pilgrims from England and the Netherlands in search of religious freedom, in search of a new land, came to the shores of Massachusetts right about Cape Cod, and they settled in their colony of Plymouth. They were aiming for Virginia. They were off by just a little bit, and so I don't think they had any idea of the winters that we face up here in the north. And so with a crew of about 100, they, they make their settlement, and a year goes by. But during that winter time, those months of cold, they're unprepared, and through starvation and through poor shelter, uh, they lose about half the crew. And so for three days in November in 1601, they take time to set aside and reflect on all that they do have. Here, having facing this time of tribulation, this time uh, of, of struggle and, and loss, they take time to remember all that they still have. And the 53, along with natives, celebrated and gave thanks to God, Creator, for the harvest that they had brought in and for all that was before them, even with all that was behind. And so we celebrate that even still today, recognizing that it is important to take time to make space in our lives to reflect and remember what it is that we are to be grateful for. It's a necessity, and we see it in the characteristics of people. Those who truly come to a place to see the blessings in their lives and appreciate them, whether it's in relationships, in possessions, in different things, in opportunities, in tasks, in our relationship with God. When somebody walks into the room with a grateful heart, it's hard to hide. They brighten the atmosphere. They lift you up. They're quick to build up. It's from that gratitude that we see these other virtues pour out, the fruit of the Spirit pour out. And so when one is thankful, it changes the atmosphere. They have an effect on those around them. It is contagious when you have somebody who understands and is appreciative of all that is before them. But in the same manner, those who tend to take things for granted and those who just go from one thing to the next and forget to reflect come to a place to be unappreciated. And if that 
pattern continues on for any amount of time, it brings them to a place to be bitter and cold. And you can also tell when they enter the room. And the Bible tells us that, man, it is better to live on the corner of a roof than with one who is a constant drip, one who is always arguing, one who is always cynical, always coming against that which would be good, always finding the wrong in a good situation. Man, studying the Word of God is always convicting, especially as one who teaches it, one who preaches from it, uh, because I don't have it all down. That's the point of Jesus. That's the point of grace. And so as I study, I myself am convicted, and I see that we, according to Philippians chapter 2, are never to come to a place to grumble or complain. It's not just that God wants us to be grateful. Man, we're never to be ungrateful. At the same time, it says, do all things without grumbling or disrupting, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God who are above reproach. God wants us to come to a place to be so full of gratefulness, so full of thanksgiving, that man, the complaints never even cross our mind, let alone come out of our mouths. But I look at my life, I recognize the times where even in sight of blessing, I can complain, or I can begin to crumble. And if you would, man, just reflect with me, even, even if I go out for breakfast, I kind of pride myself in my cooking in the morning. I love my breakfast time, and I, I can make a delicious burrito. And so when I go out and I spend, like, hard-earned cash, you know, on breakfast, I take that first bite <sighs> after thanking God for my meal. Why is it the first words that are in my mouth are, man, I should have saved my money. Man, I could have made this better at home. I should have just bought the ingredients and taken the time. Recognize the situation. Here, I went to an establishment, took a seat. Somebody came to me, asked me what I wanted to eat, what I wanted to drink. They went and relayed the message to somebody else who slaved over it in the kitchen, then returned it to them who brought it out, placed it before me. And in the midst of all that I have to be grateful for, it's a complaint that first comes to mind. Or maybe you can relate with a job that you wanted or that you fought for and you went through the interviews and you finally got and now the money is flowing in and this is what you have prayed for, that God would bless you with finances, that he would come in and, and provide work for you. And then you find out that you have to work overtime and they want to pay you time and a half and you're upset about it. I'm not blaming you. I'm saying what's wrong with us, right? But if we allow the devil to come into our lives, he will take what God has intended for blessing and allow his lies, which he has been feeding into mankind since the garden, like a virus, to come in and twist and turn the very blessings that we have into curses. And Jesus uh, recognizes um, really the importance of gratitude in our lives and how we should come to a place to be grateful for all that he has done for us. In Luke chapter 17, uh, he is passing on his way to Jerusalem. He goes by Samaria and uh, he, he, is, he comes upon a small village, and there's, there's ten people there. Ten who have, uh, have, have this disease of leprosy and are cast out from society. They've come to a place to be so sick and so eroded in their skin and, and what's inside of them that a sneeze could be deadly as it passes that disease. Man, oftentimes those with leprosy man, would lose parts of their body, and so it was just unpleasant to even see them losing the pain and, and feeling in their limbs. It was easy to, after many times, knocking your finger or an arm to lose a part of a body because you just no longer could feel the sense of pain. It's amazing that even pain could be a blessing, but you don't know it until it's gone. But here you have these ten who are under this disease and their clothes are torn because society has cast them out and set them apart. And they see Jesus coming, and they know that he is the healer. They have heard his teachings. They recognize him as master, and they cry out, Master, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus sees them. He recognizes them. And even from a distance, he just says, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And hearing his words, coming to a place of faith, they turn and they begin to walk and carry out their journey. But as they do, something miraculous happens. Like those body parts that had fallen off start growing back. And their skin, which is eroded and just ugly, is renewed. They come to a place of healing, of restoration. Man, a life change, a dramatic turn of events. And one of them turns around and falls at the feet of Jesus, recognizing, taking time to appreciate what has just happened. 
He begins to pour out his praise and thanksgiving to God. Jesus looks at the one and says, what about the other nine? Were they not all healed too? Where are they? And one thing that this teaches us is that Jesus, God, encourages us, demands and commands us to have gratitude. But it's with great purpose. As Philippians chapter 2 goes on to say, don't just not grumble, don't just not complain. There's a point behind it all. It's so that we would prove ourselves to be blameless, that we would be innocent, that nobody would be able to hold anything against us, that truly we would act like children of God who are above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among those whom you appear to be a light in the world. God expects us to have gratitude, and it's with great purpose. He's left us here with a mission, with a task. We are to be reflective and thankful for all that God has done in our lives. Why? Because our eyes have been opened to the truth of the matter. And there are those who are still blind. The blind can't lead the blind. Jesus says they both fall into the pit. And so he leaves it on us, those who have, have recognized him as Savior and in Lord, those who have recognized the blessing of life, that there is this gift within our lungs, that we have breath within our bones. We come to a place to be grateful. Because as we look at the world, there's just this war going on. We're in the midst of a battlefield, and it appears as though we are on enemy territory. Man, it's not hard to find a complaint. You would be amazed at how much grumbling can go over one red cup. It's insanity. It's crazy. God is calling us to a place to be grateful, but it seems that there is always something to complain about. And if not one thing, it's another. And when that disappears, something else springs up. And there is always something. We can always find fault if that's what we're looking for. And so there's this change of perspective that has to take place within us as believers. Because even if you acquire wealth and even if you acquire health and you get fame and beauty, man, all of that stuff is temporary. Your wealth can be taken away. Your beauty can fade. Things come and go in life. And so if we base our gratitude or our level of thankfulness on the here and now, it is destined to go up and down, up and down like a wave of the sea. The Bible says such a man is double-minded, unstable in all he does. It is no good to place our hope or determine our level of thankfulness or value off momentary things. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth. This is verse 19. Don't build your kingdom on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves come and break in and steal, but rather lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust can destroy, neither where thieves can break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why would we give our heart to momentary things? See, it's not that God doesn't want to bless us. Every good and, and perfect thing in our lives comes down from God. He chooses to bless us. He wants us to have good things, but as Dave Ramsey would say, He doesn't want us to have our things have us. God wants us to have good things, but if they have us, we've missed the point. If that's where our heart is, it's vulnerable. It's up for attack. You see, a heart, the, the abundant life that God gives us is not guarded by our white picket fence, but by the very Word of God. And so if we set it up with the momentary things, if we build and invest ourselves in the here and now in things that can be taken away, man, we leave our heart wide in the open in enemy territory. And that's not what God wants. He says, rather... Rather, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Change your perspective. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Man, tell us to look where Christ is, to dwell on that. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ as believers, it's on us. It's on us. Blind can't lead the blind. It's on us, those who have seen, those who have a renewed sight, a renewed mindset, those who have been raised up with Christ, to keep, to continually go after, seeking the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Man, it's an active decision, a choice. We have to be intent on giving thanks. 
We have to set our mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Verse 22 says, the lamp of the body is the eye. I believe Jesus is talking about perspective, the way that we see things in our life. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. God has left us here with a mission and a task to lead the blind. But why is it that so often the blind lead those who see? Why have we allowed the enemy to come in with his schemes and set up through advertising and through media and television, robbing us of our joy and thankfulness that we should be complete in Christ? Man, all of a sudden, we're, we're watching a television show and we, we see that staircase and we see the wallpaper and this looks like this beautiful home and all of a sudden the shelter that God has given us is not enough. And we're staring at a television set. It's a half a house. <laughs> it's not even a full thing. But God, but if we, if we do not fix our eyes on the things above, we will settle for so much less. And we will allow the enemy to come in and steal our joy and rob us of the blessings that God has meant and intended for us to be thankful for and for us to appreciate. And it's all in our perspective. It's all in how we see it. Why is it that we seek to keep up after the Kardashians? Seriously. They should stop, turn around, and come after us. We shouldn't want what Hollywood has. They should look at the Christians. They should look at the church and be like, I want that. I want the abundant life. I want the peace that comes with it. We should have a gratitude and a thankfulness that overflows from our hearts. But it's only achievable if we change our mindset. And we don't value the here and now. We don't value that which is so temporary, that which can be destroyed and taken away. Man, circumstances in life come. Everything can be going great. And it takes one phone call, one mishap, one moment of not paying attention, or maybe a moment of someone else not paying attention, for our world to drastically change. Our hope can't be based on something temporary. Jesus goes on uh, to really give one of my favorite sermons of Scripture, and it's entitled, The Cure for Anxiety. He says, man, why is it that we chase after the things in which the world chases, in which the world values? Man, we spend so much time worrying about what we're going to eat and what we're going to wear. Is not life so much more than that. Does not God take care of the bird? Look at the flowers of the field and how they're dressed. Not even Solomon looked like that in the glory of his splendor and all that he had obtained and all the wealth that he had. Our gratefulness in life cannot be based on what we have accumulated, what we have built up, because that can all be taken away. He says, rather seek first the kingdom of God, change your perspective, change your pursuit, and go after my kingdom, and I will add those things to you. And if you would flip over to Philippians chapter 4. And there's just this, this freedom that comes with that. Here, the secret of gratitude we're going to explore with Paul. He writes to the church in Philippi, uh, and the very first words that he says are rejoice. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say Rejoice. We have to recognize that on this battlefield, God's given us a command. He's made His will for us very clear. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18 point out three things. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. That is not our natural response. Only one came back when he had something to be grateful for. All ten, all ten went through the miraculous healing. All ten were restored and brought to a place of fullness. They had a reason to give thanks. But even with that, only one came. So how is it that we can become so full of gratitude that even in the midst of the storms of life, even when our chaos is all around us, even when things don't go our way, that we are satisfied, that we are complete, that we are made whole? that we are satisfied and have the peace of God. Paul goes on to say this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. From behind prison bars, Paul is able to encourage others to take joy. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God 
which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Man, it is on us. We have received the grace, but we have to recognize the very real battle that takes place. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Therefore, above all else, as Christians, we have to guard ourselves. We have to protect ourselves because there is a warfare at hand. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, 4 and 5 tell us that we need to be aware of every thought that would come across our mind with advertising, with music, with television. And then we hear it, but do we get the message? There's so much that can come into our mind and steal our joy. We can look at an ad and see, man, my hair's just not perfect. I don't have that six-pack like he does. There's so much that can come in and turn our world around off things that we were never even meant to find satisfaction. The weapons that we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension, any thought that would come in, man, anything that would come against the Word of God, that we would capture, that we would set ourselves up against it. And by the knowledge of God, we would take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Man, we have to guard our hearts because the enemy would love to whisper lies and he would love to tell us that we're not good enough and he would love to remind us of our past failures and our past mistakes. But that's when we take that thought and we remind ourselves, it's not based on me. I know I failed. I know I messed up. That's the whole point of Jesus. It's on us to really protect our mind and to remind ourselves to not question, to not doubt the best tool that the enemy has. His greatest weapon is disbelief. If he can get into our minds and get us to question, man, that like a virus will continue to spread and will continue to wreak havoc in our minds. We need to be able to grab the thoughts that come in and line up every thought, every perspective, every philosophy with the Word of God. Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Paul is writing this from the jail cell. Truly, he's figured it out. Truly, he has had a change of perspective. God has done a work in his life where he is satisfied even behind bars. It's amazing. Sometimes we're not satisfied getting paid by the hour. What is it in our perspective that we need to open up our eyes to the things above and truly dwell on the truth of God? Jesus says that truth sets us free. But do we allow that freedom, that truth, to soak and dwell within us? Man, he has immersed himself in the ways of God and shifted his perspective to the point where he goes on to say, I have learned the secret of being content. It's not about my situation. It's not about my circumstance. Whether I have plenty, whether I'm in an abundance, or I am in a place of need, and I am without, and there is great lack in my life, my gratitude, my thankfulness, my attitude, it remains the same. Because it's not based on the things of the world. No, he says, I've learned the secret. And therefore, the verse that we love to quote, Philippians 4.13, I can endure, I can do, I can move forward through all things because Christ strengthens me. See, he got the secret of gratitude. To not base it on the here and now. To not let the values or opinions of others or the things that we've owned or acquired dictate where we stand in our thankfulness but to base it on something outside of our realm, something that is constant, something that is never changing. So he has based it on the grace of God. The secret of gratitude is the grace of God. Grace generates gratitude in our lives. We can't let it grow stale. We can't take it for granted. Morning after morning, it is to be new. We are to open our eyes and come to a place to remember just exactly what we have deserved. That because of this world we've been born into, we are deserving of death. Death is a just judgment for the sinner. But God, rich in His mercy, poured forth His love upon us through His Son that where we were deserving of death, Christ died that we would receive life. Christ died that we would receive life. That was my death. That was my payment. But because of God's willingness, because of His love, my life is forever changed. 
man, I don't have to worry about what I build up in the here and now. My life could be taken from me, but because of the salvation of God, man, my gratitude, my thankfulness is steadfast because even death has lost its sting. Because in death, I know that I am to be present with God. My thankfulness and gratitude is that my soul is saved, that no matter what circumstance, no matter what would come against me, whether it's from friend or foe, no matter the storm of life, I have a reason to be thankful, and it's because God, even in my sin, even in the thick of my mess, loved me enough to give of himself, giving his only son, that I would be free. Don't let the message of the cross grow stale. Because that's when we begin to grumble, complain, take things for granted, and our hearts grow cold. It's got to be new, and it's got to be fresh. And I'm preaching to myself that morning after morning, I would remind myself of the faithfulness of my God, the price that was paid in spite of my debt, that I would be given life. Father God, we thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your grace and goodness. God, truly, your word is life-changing. It opens our eyes to a new perspective. God, and you call us to, Lord, be the light to the world. God, our attitudes should be so full of joy and so full of peace and so full of life from a place of joy, of thanksgiving. God, it's got to be a thanksgiving based on what you have done, based on the eternal work of the cross, one that is steadfast and never changing. Father, if we are to be thankful in all things, Lord, that is your will for us. If we are to be thankful in all things, God, it comes from shifting our perspective from an earthly perspective to heaven. Remembering the joy that is set before us so that in the here and now, in the current moment, in the current struggles, in the strife that comes, in the temptation that swings, in our own failures, God, we are not shaken, we are not dismayed, we are not discouraged, but we stand firm upon the rock of salvation. God, we stand firm upon the rock of your promise. That where once we were damned to death, now we are welcomed as children of God, co-heirs with Christ. It is in this that we have an attitude of thanksgiving, where we begin to live a life of gratitude, where we see things differently. God, I pray this mindset would be ours. God, that we would guard our hearts with your righteousness, God, like a breastplate, that we would guard our minds, Father, with the helmet of salvation. God, the very assurance that our soul has been saved. God, in that morning after morning, we would cling to our faith. God, reminding ourselves that you are worthy to be praised. Truly, the love of God endures forever. And in that, there is great thanksgiving. If you have never had that opportunity to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And I want to give that to you right now that is between you and God there's nothing I can do I have spoken scripture I have read the word of God but that is on you to change your perspective to recognize God I cannot build my kingdom here God for when I die I can't take it with me but I recognize Lord that you have called me to your kingdom Lord that you have welcomed me in that you have opened up the arms God, that I would be received as a son, as a daughter of the living King, forgiven and free forevermore. I know for a fact that there will be more than one right here, right now, who will come to a place to show gratitude for where we were once outcast, given over to a degenerate disease, one that would lead to our own death. God had mercy on us, and through Jesus, we have been given new life. Join me in the thanking of our King, in Jesus' name. Amen.